if you think about a content flywheel, I think that podcasts are absolutely key to that because it is hard to come up with new ideas for content. Like any of these things that you're seeing down and you're like, okay, I need to make clips for Instagram. What clip is going to do what, like, what can I make? And then you're like sitting down to do a take and you're like, okay, here we go. Now that was crap. Okay. Let me No, that one was bad too. And podcasting, it's like, we get to just talk and riff on ideas and then go back and figure out what was good. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get started. Let's do it. Sweet. We got Nathan Barry here, CEO of ConvertKit. I mean, there's a there's a million interviews with you and how you started ConvertKit and everything, but this is a, a huge company. Um, what's the valuation of the company right now? 320 million. Nice. And so, I mean, when did you start ConvertKit? Uh, 10 years ago. So January 1st, 2013. And it started, you were like a designer and then started this. Yeah. So I want to, I want to get into this because I think a lot of people watching this will know ConvertKit. I'm a personally a big user of ConvertKit. I pay you a bunch of money every month. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Here's the thing. I remember when you first started, you called me a couple of times as well yeah. as you called, I think hundreds of people oh, yeah. asking them like, why does Infusionsoft suck? Why does AWeber suck? Why does MailChimp suck? What do you not yeah. like about them? And then you started this little side project ConvertKit. Now, there were already a bunch of email companies doing what you do. Yeah. Why did you think that you could compete against them? Or was that the way you thought about it? Well, I really thought of the intersection between two things. One, I used MailChimp personally, right? And and I was late to the game of email. Like I remember the first book that I uh, self-published, it's called the App Design Handbook. I launched that, you know, and I was thinking between email and guest posts and uh, Twitter and Instagram, like... It's all like, we're going to get sales from all of these Mm -hmm. and really like 80 or 90% of the sales came from the email list. Mm -hmm. And so I'm showing up to, I'm like, did you like email is crushing it. It's converting better than every other channel combined. And friends who'd been in marketing for a long time were like, yeah, we've known this since 2001. Like what, (laughs) you know, I'm like, this is amazing. And they're like, you just, you know, coming in and be like, the sky is blue. And they're like, "Uh, how did you not notice before? Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at email and using MailChimp and I'm like, just obsessing over the best practices and what to do and, and, uh, you know, how to optimize your lead magnets and automations and everything else. And everything was a total pain. Like it was really hard to do. And so then I was like, okay, well, I guess I need to switch platforms. What does everyone use? And Infusionsoft was the thing at the time that all the like serious marketers. Yeah. Like if you were like a real guy, yeah, you you used Infusionsoft Infusionsoft. and I'm a designer. So I'm like, okay, Infusionsoft, I come to that. I'm like, I can't use this like this. It was so clunky. Notoriously so called confusion song. Conf- yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, I am not only am I a designer, my content is about teaching user experience design for web applications. And I'm like, this is, there's no way. And so I was really thinking about building a product that lived between those two. And actually another customer of ours, Seth Spears, maybe a couple of years later, described ConvertKit as the power of Infusionsoft, but easier to use than MailChimp. And that, line of copywriting. Like he just said it as an offhand comment as we were walking to lunch at an event one day. Uh, but that line stuck with me. And I ended up running that as a headline mm-hmm. in a ton of direct sales emails. And it worked really, really well because people didn't know how to position. You're like, convert it. What is this thing that you've built? And they wanted to know how does it fit within existing things? So it's basically like, the, you know, the, you know, you hear people use a phrase like, oh, this is Uber for dog walkers to like get instant context. And so the power of Infusionsoft. It's like, okay, this is a really powerful product, you know, but easier to use than MailChimp. Then it's like, ooh, all right. We, and if we have this like power and uh, complexity, you know, spectrum, like and I now know how to position it. And so that that one phrase of copywriting made us a ton of money. For, I feel like it always happens like that. Some customer or someone's just like, well, what about this? And you're like, Oh, I got to write that down. <laughs> yeah. And they're not even trying That's to give cool. you copy. They're just like describing it, you know. Did MailChimp and Infusionsoft get pissed at you for that? You, because I remember with AppSumo, we said it's like Groupon, but for software. And, and everyone's like, oh, Groupon for software. I get it. And then like Groupon reaches out and is like, hey, you got to stop this. <laughs> yeah. We never had anything like that. I didn't run it as um, ads or like I wasn't running it publicly out there on the yeah. web extensively, but I would use it on podcasts and then I would use it a lot in like the direct sales emails, yeah. right? Cause reaching out to people like you and others, uh, yeah, I, w- I would send a bunch of emails and basically, you know, say, Hey, wh- like I see you're using infusion software, what freshest you. The reason I asked is I built ConvertKit, you know, which is the power, you know, and I'd, I'd like test copywriting. And here's the, here's the part of it. I wasn't sure of. So you, okay. You were a designer. Yep. 
right? And you were doing design projects for people. This is like, you were like a freelancer essentially, right? Yeah. And so then you started converting. What are you talking about? Like you built this, like you coded this, you were probably uh, good with CSS and stuff, but were you able yeah, to build so this? Yeah. So I had done a moderate amount of development. So I had a bunch of iPhone apps that I'd built myself, like design and development. Mm -hmm. uh, but with ConvertKit, I wrote all of the front end and then I hired developers to write all of the back end and Ruby on Rails. Okay. So. And so how did you know which, okay, so AWeber and MailChimp are existing platforms. Yep. Infusionsoft, Confusionsoft was out yep. there. Existing platform, I used them for seven years and I was using them at the time that you actually called me. How are you finding the core functionality? Okay, this is a big problem with a lot of people. They want to build all the different functions of a software. What do you really, really, really focus on? How do you find out those? I think two things. One, actually using the product yourself, mm -hmm. right? Like I felt like the two hardest problems were really good email capture, right? Because if you remember back to MailChimp at the time, they would have a single opt-in form for your list, right? And so you would subscribe and you couldn't give away something. Like you used to have to use, if you wanted to make your double opt-in opt link, like go to a free PDF, you had to use their translate feature. So I'm like translating, confirm your subscription from English into another English that's like download the PDF. It's hacky. Yeah, it's, it's all of these hacks. So that was one. And like lead pages is a product. Mm -hmm. um, people who've been marketing for a long time are going to be like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Other people who are new to the game in the last like three or four years are going to be like, what world did these people live in? I used a lead page that still have it actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But like that was to make it easy to give away, you know, as they call them lead magnets, uh -huh. which, so that was really hard. Right. And I was trying to give away a sample chapter for my book. Right. And then I wanted to follow up with a series of emails, you know, like this is fairly basic stuff, but MailChimp, made that pretty difficult too. And so one thing that I did was I wanted an interface that in one view gave me all of the emails that I was writing in my sequence where it was just tabbed down the side because I was sick of both MailChimp and Infusionsoft would do this. We were like clicking into one email and you write that and you have to back all the way out and go to the next one. I'm like, no, 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 this is all a flow. Like I want to open a loop at the end of my copywriting in one email. You know, I want to like conclude all of this and then like open this little hook and leave you wanting the next email. And so I want it all to, like, as a writer, I didn't need to navigate between them easily. Well, the thing is, this all existed. Like, yeah. you could do it. But I remember, and, and I think it's just like, you're so used to just doing it the hard way. But right. you're like, yeah, I mean, this is how you do it. And then I remember I used ConvertKit for the first time. It's just like, someone signs up for a post, and I want to send them, a, a, like, a, a link to a Google Doc. Not even yeah. a PDF, just a Google Doc. And to do that in Fusion stuff, I use their like graphical interface and it would like have all these arrows and it looked cool as shit. Oh, and did you felt like, yeah. like that meme of, you know, like the string everywhere the and, and everything. Like, oh, wow. It was, it felt like a programmer <laughs> yeah. and I would, I would show it off on social media, like check this out. And all it did was like, if you signed up, it sent you a link. <laughs> That's all it did. It, it was the dumbest thing. We ever. would have that because we do, we had this concierge migration service, right? Where, which is a fancy way to say, we'll switch you to convert it and do the work. Yes. And we would come across these automations and we're like, I don't know, like, this is so sophisticated. I don't know that we can do this. And I didn't take it, dig in and be like, what does this actually do? And it would be exactly that. Like it would send a series of emails on a time delay. Or, or they would, they would always require Infusionsoft, uh, sorry to keep picking on them, but I did have a lot of problems with them. Yeah. They would kick me off my email service all the time and be like, one person clicked spam on your email. I'm like, out of 100,000, one. <laughs> uh, like, and, and they would kick me off my service and I can't yeah. send. They, they'll lock you out for 12 hours. You need to write a form to them, like basically like an essay being like, here's what <laughs> I did to clean it up. I'm like, you assholes, do it for me. I pay you thousands of dollars a month. Right. And it, it, was, it was so bad. Like that was the best thing out there. And they'd be like, you have to do this list hygiene thing. I'm like- why don't you just have a button that says list hygiene or better yeah, do yet, it do it automatically where you just remove all the old subscribers Yeah, because you making me run reports to figure it out is like, why? Like, what, what are you doing? Yeah, Like, I don't get it. So I think that's, there was a lot of opportunity to come in as a user, mm -hmm. right? And using the product myself and saying, okay, this is what I want to exist in the world. And then the other thing is just talking to a lot of creators, right? Like the phone calls that we had talking through it, like I had those with hundreds of other creators too. People were like, this is what drives me crazy. I'm like, either, yeah, that drove me crazy and I've already solved it. Or 
those are really good notes. Like, yeah, let me go talk to our dev team and and get it solved. So you just did you, how many? How many? Do you know how many calls you did? Did you have like a number? Like, if I talk to a hundred people, I'll get what people. I didn't use. have anything like that. It was just as many conversations as possible, and that's even true today, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, I'm out here in Austin, and I'm having as many meetings and conversations as possible to like understand. You know, like I just finished this meeting with Shane Parrish right before this, and you know, I've got a whole bunch of notes on. You know, we're we're talking about broad things of um, you know, as creators, his business and all of that. But one thing I'm making sure to ask is like, hey, what are the most frustrating things for you as a user of ConvertKit? Mm-hmm. And I'm writing all those things down. What what do you most want to see in the next three years, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, he's saying like, you know what, honestly, just make it absolutely as fast as possible, right? To every screen load as the list grows to hundred thousand, five hundred thousand users, like software naturally slows down. Yeah. And so he's saying like, oh. I just like make it as snappy as possible. And I'm like, great, that's fantastic. And I'm going to take all of that back to our product team. Um, and, and, but then, but then I'm sure people give, I'm sure there's like this normal curve of like, everyone's like, yeah, I like it faster, I like it easier, I like it'll look yeah. pretty, but then people have these edge cases. Yeah. And there's, so there's stuff where I'm like, oh, here's a way that I know you could handle that. Right. Here's a workaround for that. But I, I have a pretty good filter on like, what I'm hearing come up in a bunch of conversations. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, we really need to fix that or, or change that versus what thing I'm like, yeah, cool. Here's a, here's a workaround for you, but I'm not going to like custom build a bunch of stuff. Because if, if you asked me a few years ago, what I would want to see in there, I actually probably wouldn't even know that there are problems. For example, I used to use Photoshop a lot yeah. back in the day. Now I use mainly Canva. And then you guys added a little editor inside right. to make images. I do a lot of crappy drawings on my stuff. And so I use my mouse to just draw arrows. And I'm like, this looks like what I do. But I normally go on my iPad, take a screenshot, send it to my Wait, thing. so you do that just directly in the ConvertKit? All the time. Image- oh, I had no idea. All the time. And people are asking me, how do you do so many images? You, I'm just like, let's do it. Because you just, you, yeah, you're writing an email. You're like, oh, I need an image. And it's right there. It didn't make you go anywhere else. Yeah, part of my brand has always been like crappy drawings. Yeah. Which, which is a fortunate thing. <laughs> and 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 I just do it directly. Yeah, everyone who's market. like making part of their brand like really sophisticated, like you're making you it doing? way harder than it needs to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and so, and so I just do all the editing directly in there. And it's kind of funny. So now whenever we go into our forum or one of our WordPress pages or something, and I have to edit an image, I'm like, oh shit, I got to go to like Canva and then screenshot it here. And I can't do it directly in the editor. Now the editor isn't like the craziest yeah. thing on the planet, yeah. but it's got all the elements. I, I can make a shape, I can make text, and I can draw stuff. Yeah. That, done. And a crop. Yeah, you know, that, that's all I need. That was the main thing I wanted, honestly, was the crop. Because you'd pull in something like, oh, that doesn't, in this landing page or this email, it doesn't quite look right. I'm like, oh, let me crop it. Well, well, Infusionsoft actually, they added one uh, in their editor where you can edit it, but it was like a full on Photoshop replication, okay. which, which I will say the implementation was good, Yeah, but it was slow. It was clunky. And every time you opened it up, it was like loading, loading. And then like, you see the elements load and it was it, it, like on a phone. I didn't even know what would happen. Yeah. I'd probably just die. And so I remember thinking like, this is good, but it has, it's like Photoshop. It's got 400,000 tools yep. that I do not need. Whereas yours is like, here's four things and you can't do anything else. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the other thing, I remember this is a common thing. And like, now that I think about it, convert gets so much better than these other ones. Every time I load up an email, if I edited it again, multiple times, it would be like WordPress. Sometimes it would blow up the whole email. And it would, all, <laughs> yeah. all the elements would be like, this is larger text and this is Nine gone. times out of 10, it works perfectly. The 10th time, sorry, that's a hand grenade. <laughs> and it, and it's the, the worst thing is that nine times out of 10 is when it's long and long. The longer it is and the more time and effort you have, yeah. the, the more yeah. likely it is to blow up. Whereas ConvertKit, it's just like you have a, here's what you get and it never fails, yeah. which is great. So of all the C, uh, ConvertKit uses, what are the ones people were most using it for in the beginning? Was it like newsletters, emails, podcasts, YouTube? I mean, all of the above, like what was the use case in the beginning? I mean, early on, it was a lot of like professional bloggers who were building newsletters as well, right? Mm-hmm. That was- Even back then, that was the thing. Yeah, I mean, if you think about people at the time, if, if you were going to like Chris Gillibo, Joel Runyon, um, you know, a whole bunch of other people in that space, right? The blog was the primary so- traffic source for most people. Mm-hmm. Right, because in in any, in any content creation, most people, whether they know it or not, follow a hub and spoke model, mm-hmm. where they have uh, these different spokes, which are channels that have distribution. So it might be YouTube, Instagram, um, somewhat a podcast, but podcasts don't have native distribution very, very uh, effectively. Uh, SEO, 
right? There's a few of these things that you're focusing, these different spokes. And then you're bringing everyone back to the hub, which is usually your email list. And so in that, uh, in the early days, or early days, someone's going to come in who's been on the internet since like 2004 and be like, you're calling 2013, the early days, yeah. <laughs> you know, but like, okay, 10 years ago, uh, the most common is you had a blog mm -hmm. and you were ranking through organic traffic mm -hmm. and then sites like dig and hacker news and Reddit, you know, would get you good one-off traffic as well. And so SEO was huge and the blog was huge driving to an email newsletter. Now, that's shifted a lot where most people building the fastest growing newsletters now, SEO is still important, but like you see people like their different spokes are going to be like Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, or YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, something like that. Yeah. And so those use cases have, have shifted, but it's a pretty versatile product. So. It yeah. works across the board. One of the things I was most excited to talk to you about is like you get the insider look, yeah. like what people are actually doing. Like, how, like people say one thing on social media and then the other thing. So I think back in the day, like like I remember 2013 and, and before, SEO was like the gold standard. Yeah. Like if you yeah. can get SEO traffic, it's free leads. Everyone was talking about it. I think in the last three to four years, definitely after, uh, you know, all the pandemic and everything, there's been like a tectonic shift and SEO value. Mm -hmm. and, and we used to, I've always run my business based off SEO and I've started noticing the value of those customers drop like a lot. Mm. Okay. Compared to someone who's found me on YouTube, compared to someone who listened to a podcast, compared to someone who's uh, following me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. And are you seeing that as well? That just like the SEO part like is good, but I think for most people, they're probably getting the most amount of traffic off of social platforms. Social platforms used to be like where you go to advertise your blog. Now it's like people follow you on that platform to follow you on that platform. Yeah, they don't want to go to your blog. Yeah, when well, the platform doesn't want them <laughs> to go to your blog, right? Exactly. That's the other thing. Well, all, oftentimes too, even with Twitter, someone's like, someone's like, I wrote a long post about something. I'm like, just tell me what you wrote. Like, yep. what are here? What are you doing? You're making me click. Now I got to go to the thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll often do that. Like a lot of, Twitter threads or long posts on Twitter that I've done uh, are just the blog post and it'll sometimes do really, really well on Twitter or I'll take like a long essay and summarize it on Twitter in a thread. Yeah. And then I'm like, Hey, if you want this in a different format, like <laughs> you just got the abridged version. If you yeah. want the longer one, there's a link to it. But yeah, it seems like it's, it, I almost always thought or well, before, I think it was wise advice that you have a blog where all your stuff lives. Now, if I was starting out, or what would you what would you suggest? Would someone start out starting a blog first, or just going on social, figuring their stuff out, figuring their voice, figuring their content, and then making a blog? Yeah, I would I would go social first because we can get so caught up in how do we install WordPress, what domain, you know, all of this other stuff that it's like, look, are you going to show up and write every single day for two years straight? Because if you're not going to do that, what do you? What are you doing? Like, well, that's the table stakes to even- Well, so like, I, there used to be this distinction between a blog and social media. Mm -hmm. And and I would posit that it's the same thing. What is Twitter? You have an editor, you write a thing, and you share it. And then hopefully people comment. And it has native functionality like that built in. It works on every platform. It works on every device. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a blog, right? It's, it's just like a, it's like a blog with a lot of restrictions. Yeah, a lot of restrictions and built-in distribution, whereas the blog does not have. So if I, if I write something on a blog and post it, I now have to go into ConvertKit, send it out to my email list to get people to read it or go on social and get people yeah. to read it, which almost seems like if I was a, if I was starting out as a 10 year old today, that seems pretty stupid. Like why well, would you I think you look at people who like Sahil Bloom is a great example. He's built his entire audience in the last three and a half, four years. Uh, and has very like Twitter native, right? He's focused entirely on that and it's grown. Well, I think he has a million followers there now, mm -hmm. but he focused on that very heavily and then expanded to other platforms. Mm -hmm. So I would do that. I would pick one platform, you know, Instagram, if you're more, uh, visual or video content focused and Twitter, if you're written focused and build that habit and that muscle over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's a huge amount of value in, long form content, mm -hmm. right? Like I like to write these, I guess, flagship essays that really break down a topic and I want them to have a link that can always be viewed. And these essays get hundreds of thousands of, of views mm -hmm. and I see them get referenced on social platforms all the time. Um, and that's what a blog is great for. I feel like of having this it's a home for your stuff to live. Yeah. Yeah. And I like to build up that 
I don't know, repository of, or like that body of work that you can't really do on a social platform. What? It used to be that you would post a lot, like on a blog, and Google would reward just like the frequency of posting. Yep. And as any social platform does in its early days, because it wants users. Then over time, it gets saturated. And then they're like, okay, let's, let's just put the yep. quality stuff here. And so now with the blog, I think you could have three to five just really good pieces that you're known mm -hmm. for. And there's probably like three to five concepts that like you have, like that are the hits that, are, that you're known for. And I think everyone has that. And I think that's all you really need. I don't think you need to post a lot on a blog anymore. Yeah, I, I'm trying to decide b the difference between what I want to exist in the world and what actually works. Mm. Do you ever have it where you come across a blog? I haven't had this in a long time, but it used to happen to me a lot. And you like binge read the entire thing. Absolutely. Right. And you're just like, who is this person? I feel like I've just discovered my new best friend on the internet. Wait, but why? Classic oh, example. 100% where you're just like going through all this. For me, that was uh, Chris Gillibo. Like back, mm -hmm. he was like, came across his site and I'm like, travel for free? Earn a living on the, like, <laughs> what, what is this magical world that I've discovered? <laughs> and so that idea, you know, Chris would post every, I think Monday and Thursday mm -hmm. at the exact same time, right? Like clockwork. And so I would actually, yeah, I'd be subscribed to his RSS feed, but I would go to his site and be like, oh, it's you know, 9.55 on a Thursday. And so in five more minutes that that post is going to drop. And there, it's just a different feeling on social. Like, you, I don't feel like you go back. Maybe it happens. I guess it happens on Instagram probably with mm -hmm. people's reels. You might go back and like binge a whole bunch of their content. Twitter, you don't like read someone's Twitter profile. So it's sort of like joining like that moment in time yeah. forward. Uh, and I do like that, the body of work from a blog where like you could go read all of their greatest hits. Honestly, newsletters don't do this super well. You can go back. You know, if they have an archive, you can go back and read the past issues, uh -huh. but it doesn't have quite the same feel. So anyway, I'm nostalgic for some of the early days of blogging. Uh, same. I, I always, I always miss it. And some of the longer form articles where they're just well thought out yeah. and everything. But to be fair, I always think like, cause I always think like, okay, these short reels are kind of like taking over everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are my own habits? And I probably watch now four to 500 short clips per one blog article I read. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And also, I just don't, I don't think there's a lot of blog articles being read. Um, I don't want to jump ahead, but I do have this yeah. thought that like newsletters are the new blog. Like back in the day, everyone's starting a blog. Now is everyone starting a newsletter? And I'm like, it's the same thing. You write a bunch of stuff and send it out. It's, it's kind of a similar thing. Let, but, let's talk. But the reason on that uh, is that the, the blog does not have a push method for distribution, mm -hmm. right? It had all it had is RSS, and so everyone was looking for something else. Like, how am I going to get this content that I wrote? How am I going to tell you that it exists? Mm. And so it's like, oh, I'm going to wait for you to open up your RSS reader and go check it, mm -hmm. or I'm going to uh, hope that you come back and check. And really, it's like, no, I'm going to use email to tell you, like, hey, we have a new thing that came out. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing this thing where we'd write the blog in WordPress or whatever other platform and then send it out in your email platform. And then eventually these have just merged together. And you're like, all right, look, I don't actually need the blog anymore. I'm going to use, um, you know, use email where my writing platform has a push functionality in it by default. Because one of the things, the first article that I wrote that like went viral, mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually still pretty proud of the headline. It was titled how I made $19,000 in the app store mm -hmm. while learning to code. Mm -hmm. And I like the, any title that has like this little juxtaposition in it mm -hmm. of, I mean, Mark Manson, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the life-changing magic of tidying up where you're like, what, you know, so making $19,000 in the app store, like that's fantastic. Or that's really terrible. Like if that's your job, like you made <laughs> you know, like how are you even paying rent? You know, yeah. but if you add the well learning to code, it has that nice tweak in it. Mm -hmm. But that article went to like the top of Hacker News. It did super, super well. And I had like, at a time when my blog got no traffic at all, mm -hmm. I had, I think 35,000 unique visitors in a 48 hour period. Mm -hmm. And I thought like, oh, I've entirely made it as a blogger. <laughs> but then what happened is it was entirely a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. Like those people came, they read that, some of them left a comment and then they left and that was it. 
And so if you were to look at my Google Analytics for the time and you were to hide, well, I think that was November, 2011. If you were to hide that month, mm -hmm. you would have no idea that anything happened. Mm -hmm. Like between, you know, October was a thousand visits and December was 1400 visits. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't know that there was like 40,000 yeah. in the in-between month. And so that's when I realized that like email is this method. People are like, oh, this is good stuff. I'd love to follow what Nathan does next. Mm -hmm. And and so that's why I think blogs have changed a lot because they don't have that that way for you to follow that email does. And so I think like newsletters are the new blog. Yeah. It just it just reminds me of what people thought of blog. And also blogs would get traffic without doing anything before because people like you would have RSS feeds right. or they would just naturally go back. Like I had a list in my bookmarks of like all the blogs I like. I would just click through each one and each one would load. I would read. We just want to load. It, it, no updates. Each one to load. Yeah. And that's how it was. But now that's just not like behavior. No. People like don't go to a blog really anymore. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think you're at like one of the forefronts of newsletters, which is pretty cool. And it's a, a big topic. Partially, I'd say started by one of our friends, Sam Parr. When he sold oh, yeah. the hustle, I think everyone was like, I'm going to start a newsletter. Wait, there's money in newsletters? There, you, can make, you can sell it <laughs> yeah. what, to a public company? Like, huh? And then people started going, oh, newsletter, I can do that. I think it's one of those ways that like, Almost everyone can write to some degree, maybe not well, but they could write and there's no coding, there's no nothing. And you're like, that's a business. And so all these people are starting them. Uh, what are you seeing working in newsletters right now? What's this? Is it just the typical stuff like send a newsletter, send it to subscribers, get get sponsors? What's the thing that's working well with big newsletters you're seeing on Convert? It, it depends a lot in different niches. The most important thing is the consistency. Right. No mm -hmm. one gets to any level of scale without like showing up every day or your newsletter, you know, going out every single week mm -hmm. uh, for like three years, five years. Oh. One thing that's interesting is watching p these newsletter creators implement flywheels at scale. Yeah. And so a flywheel is, is basically where you're getting, you have a process where the momentum is feeding itself. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example from Sahil Bloom. So he is growing very quickly on social, mm -hmm. right? And so he's he's got flywheels to drive his social growth. Um, and he's a great writer and putting out a ton of content. Mm -hmm. So he focuses on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram, kind of as his three main social channels. And then he's pushing from uh, from those social channels to email, right? Hub and spoke model. Mm -hmm. How do we get back to email? And so he's using the exact same things that worked five years ago, 10 years ago of here's my like free guide to uh, planning your year. Here's my like basically lead magnets. They work just the same for conversions. So he's got a series of those. And then what's interesting is he's using a new feature in ConvertKit called Creator Network, mm -hmm. where when someone subscribes to his list, it's a, it comes up and says, hey, thanks so much for subscribing. Why don't you also check out these three other creators that I recommend, right? So James Clear, Tim Ferriss, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you sign up to James' newsletter, it does the same thing. It says, hey, why don't you also check out, you know, uh, Shane Parrish and Sahil Bloom and, right? And so everyone's sort of cross-linking, cross-promoting because mm -hmm. it solves this problem of distribution, mm -hmm. right? Email does not have a, a discovery algorithm built mm -hmm. in. So if you go from social into email, email gets this boost with Creator Network. Then what Sahil is doing is he's taking, like as his list grows, he's sending two emails a week and he's selling sponsorships in those newsletters, mm -hmm. right? And so he's making a good amount of money uh, from those sponsorships. And then he takes all the money that he's making, or at least in the early days it was all of it. Now he's making so much on sponsorships, he's only reinvesting like half of it. Yeah. <laughs> But he's reinvesting that into another product that we have called the Partner Network, which is paid recommendations. So basically, this is a marketplace where you go on there and you say, hey, I will pay you know, $2 for every engaged subscriber that another creator sends to me. Mm -hmm. And I define engaged as they open three emails in the first 14 days, something like that. And so then that makes his list bigger. So if you think of these different steps in, in the flywheel, well, actually, first... A flywheel has three basic laws. The first is that uh, all of our steps have to flow smoothly into the next till it completes a loop. Mm -hmm. Second is it needs to get easier with each rotation. 
And the third is it needs to produce more with every rotation. So we break this down. Sahil's got subscribers coming in, which makes his list bigger, you know, gets that boost in creator network. The bigger the list is, the more sponsorships he can sell, which gives him more money to reinvest in advertising to grow the list, which makes the list bigger, Mm -hmm. which means he can charge more for sponsorships, which gives him more money to reinvest and so on. So the flywheel, he's like refining it. It's getting easier with every rotation. And then it's also producing more and more. So like an early rotation of this flywheel was producing say 10,000 email subscribers because he was making a certain amount of money and could reinvest that. Now a rotation of that flywheel in a month is producing 50 to 60,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. And so just this year, he's grown the list from 150,000 to like 600,000 subscribers. Like on this, like he just does this over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, And that is working insanely well because he doesn't care about making a bunch of money from the list. He cares about, Mm-hmm. Getting to a million subscribers because he's got a book coming out and he wants to make sure that book does really, really well. Yeah. I read about his concept of flywheel. You talk about it. He talks yep. about it. I think a lot of people talk about like the flywheel concept. I called it cascading content back in the day uh-huh. before there was like a, a good word. I don't know why it's like the content cascades. And the way I have it set up is I post a bunch of crap on Twitter. I see what hits. So something gets six likes. I'm like, well, that didn't do very well. It, for, for my account, if it's 20 or above likes okay, for me. I'm like, if it's 20 or above likes, and if it's like way more than that, then great. Right. And so I'll put that in my newsletter because I'm like, those are socially proven things. These like people like these. I'll yep. put those in the newsletter. And then I also make that into a blog post and a podcast where I just read out the newsletter. I think the the podcast part has zero flywheel to it. Um, like you said, there's there's no native like growth yeah. uh, mechanism inside. Podcasts podcast. are, are hard to grow. Especially one where you're reading out a newsletter. That's not That's not great stuff. This, this is a better podcast than just reading out a newsletter. But uh, it is it is interesting. We have a copywriting company and so many people will write content for their social and then write separate content for their newsletter and separate content for their blog. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're running three different things over here. Yeah. You, you got to make these uh, spill over into each different category. Well, yeah. And how do you take one thing and get the most momentum out of it? Right. I've talked about flywheels a ton and that's one of my flagship essays right? And I'm constantly coming back to that. Another one is, um, I have this essay called the billion dollar creator Mm -hmm. and I now have a podcast called billion dollar creator, Mm -hmm. right? And so how do I keep coming back to the same thing? And it's it's exactly what you're talking about. Of too many content creators are jumping from thing to thing. And they're like, oh, I said that before. I can't say it again. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, 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 you, you've said it before and you have to say it again if you want people to listen and pay attention. Well, so I listen to all these comedy podcasts and they tell stories. And sometimes you hear like, you know, Mark Normand on like five different podcasts. Yeah. He's like, well, I told this story a bunch of times. I'm like, tell it again. It's funny. It doesn't matter. But to him, he's just like, I've said this like five times. Everyone's heard it. Right. In reality, like I just listened to one podcast he was on. I didn't listen to all five of them. So yeah, you're right. you could like say the same thing over and over. People yeah. hear it. What, what about what is not working on newsletters? What are some like crucial mistakes you're seeing in people who like get all excited about a newsletter and then it kind of fizzles out? I'm assuming the consistency, consistency or lack of uh, is important. Yeah. In paid newsletters, there's some interesting challenges where people have this free newsletter that works really well for driving growth because they're like, oh man, you got to check out whoever's content, right? It's so good. And then people will turn on a paid newsletter mm-hmm. and then they end up with this problem between mon- like they ha- they have put monetization and growth at odds with each other mm. because you're, you're like, oh, I'm going to put my best content behind a paywall, mm-hmm. right? Cause you're paying for it. You should be getting, you're paying 10 bucks a month or $25 a month or whatever. Like I want to make sure you're getting the best value, mm-hmm. but now like discovery just absolutely tanks. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it's, Paid newsletters can be really effective, but you have to think if I put my best content behind a paywall, what's going to happen for discovery? I have to have something else for discovery. Mm-hmm. And so I've seen a lot of newsletters fail when they do that mm-hmm. because again, they put monetization and growth at odds with each other. Whereas in like Sahil's example, monetization and growth, like go hand in hand, they're best friends, mm-hmm. you know, and they, uh, they work really well. So. Uh, this is a classic conundrum though. Like if you sell a course w- about video yeah. teaching a thing and you also put those that lesson, those lessons on YouTube, it's like, well, which one do you put out for free and which one do you charge for? This is, this is a classic thing. I'd say like 85% of the videos I make are private. Like they don't go on mm. YouTube. 
And so I actually think it's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do like podcasts a little bit more. One, I selfishly want to ask you questions that, yeah. you know, I want to hear. And then two, I think like, these are fun things to share that I can share openly. And then like trainings are like private, right. that kind of thing. How do, how do people generally think about that? Is, is there any way, or is it just this conundrum that's always shifting a little bit? I think 90% of your content should be free mm -hmm. and you should focus on like giving away as much as possible and getting in front of as many people as possible. And I don't worry about the overlap between free and paid content. Mm. Now, when I do paid content, it's when I am structuring this where I'm teaching you something in sequence. I'm making sure that all of the details are there. Uh, there's this amazing creator named Pat, uh, Patrick McKenzie. Mm -hmm. He goes by Patio 11 of course. on the internet. Um, Hung out with them in Japan. Oh yeah. He's, he's absolutely fantastic. And he, he said a line that always stuck with me because we would talk about like, why would someone ever buy this? Like it's, it's all for free, right? You can just find all of this for free on the internet. Mm -hmm. And he said, no HR department or no payroll department wants to write, you know, a payroll check to an employee. And like the memo line says, researching free stuff on the internet, <laughs> right? Because you're like, it's not free if I just paid you a whole bunch of money to like go and assemble this from all these different blogs. And so one, if you're selling business, like content useful to someone in a business setting, like you can absolutely charge for that. But really it's like, I will do the work to compile it for you mm -hmm. and put it in sequence of this is how you should learn design. This is how you should learn copywriting. And even if all the same information is available in little bite-sized chunks everywhere, mm -hmm. like the value is that I put it in curriculum form and taught it to you that way. So like I've talked extensively about flywheels and I've got, you know, a 4,000 word essay, mm -hmm. like breaking it down. I have tons of examples and that's entirely free. And I also have a course that I've put together teaching creative flywheels in a ton of detail. Mm -hmm. And there's a good amount of overlap between those things, but the course is in sequence and, you know, and it gives you more details, has more examples. Uh, and I don't worry about the overlap and I happily charge $1,500 for the course because it's for someone who values their time and, you know, is going to apply this to, to make far more money. The, the, an interesting way I've seen lately on how to do it is like <clears throat> with something like YouTube, you kind of have to play to the algo a little bit, for sure. right? You have to make it interesting and whatever it is, how it is. And so for inside depth, in-depth courses, like you watch me write a newsletter for 20 minutes straight, mm -hmm. with no breaks and cuts. That's not going to work on YouTube mm -hmm. at all. It, it, like, trust me, I've tried it and no one gives a shit. Um, however, if I put it in my members area, those people are already engaged and want to learn about writing, want to see what I'm doing. Yep. And so you can actually do that and they go, hey, this is a great video. I learned a lot from it. So I think that's the way I've been thinking about that lately, that like the stuff with cuts and like a, a proper thing, that's for YouTube and the rest in-depth training where I think the real learning happens, uh, but it is more boring. Yeah. And so inside. like using the flywheels example, I might talk about in the public content here's how it works. It's more inspirational. Like we're running through Sahil's example. We're um, explaining here's why this works and mm -hmm. all that. And then in the course, I'm doing that. And I'm also saying, as you go to implement it, here's exactly how your flywheel probably won't work. Here's how to troubleshoot it. Here's how to, mm -hmm. right? Like no one wants, that's not top of funnel content. That's like, detailed okay what actually goes wrong as i try to implement this but well, i think your youtube version is like you mentioned that flywheels have three things like when yeah. you said that i was like oh that's very interesting <laughs> yeah. i think your paid course probably goes into like here's, here's exactly number one why let's go into five different things about number one correct yeah right and so i break down that you know if it's go if it's like a uh, lot two is that uh, it gets easier with every rotation okay, why does it get easier? Well, reputation is improving. You know, you've optimized processes. You know, there's there's like a, some very specific things. Hmm. And that's in the paid course where you would, you know, and you, you can talk about it for free as well, but but that's where you'd go into a bunch of detail and explain exactly why something works. That you're saying is like, that's not gonna pop in a Instagram reel, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's That's not like, that's <laughs> yeah. like solid stuff. Let's <laughs> right? go into law number two of why it works. In case, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just not going to be, versus like, <laughs> this kid made $60,000 a month yeah. doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah, with this one weird trick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what about uh, what about podcasting? So podcasting is another one of those things <laughs> like this, where you just sit down and talk and you're like, hey, we put out some content. Right. What are you seeing work 
there because podcasting also has no natural virality built in. Correct. A hundred thousand people watch this podcast today. That's cool. That's fine. But that, it, it doesn't like boost it. Whereas YouTube, 100,000 people watch it. YouTube goes, hey, something's going yeah. on this video. Let's let's stack it up. So what, what are you seeing people? What, what are some pros and cons of podcasting that you're seeing? Uh, good examples, bad examples? Well, so it's another thing like email where it's further down the funnel. Now, so it has it has two an advantage over email and then a huge disadvantage. So the advantage is like the the high fidelity of someone's voice, right? You see like podcasting ads do really, really well because someone is like actually talking about, you know, your favorite person to listen to is now talking about Squarespace, right? Yeah. You know, and so that, like the credibility there, um, video has this as well, where you feel like, oh, I know this person, mm-hmm. right? You look like, it's the most intimate thing you're like putting in the headphones and you're like, now I just have Sam Parr in my head for, you know, an yeah. hour straight. <laughs> Right. And email, you don't quite have the same affinity to your favorite writers. Like mm-hmm. it, it just doesn't quite resonate in that same way. Mm-hmm. So I think podcast has that over email. Um, the disadvantage is podcasting sucks at pushing out content. Yeah. I am looking for it, right? It's RSS all over again. Yeah. And so it's just like, oh, what is in my, what new episodes came out? you know, that I look for, but there's no push mechanism like there is with email or with SMS. And so that's why I think you can't, like, you can't only do podcasting or you can't only do email or something like really the, the blend of more of these. Um, and then, as you said, podcasting email share the problem of there's no discovery algorithm. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of this resurgence in podcasting is really fueled by uh, Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, right? There's a lot of podcasts that are way bigger on YouTube than they are on Apple podcasts or Spotify, yeah. right? Like half of their total downloads or more are coming from, uh, or at least the growth. YouTube. Yeah. That's where the growth engine is coming from. Yeah. And so it, it's just, it's fascinating. Like the balance between all of these. Uh, I think, I think the big player in the room is Apple, right? Mm-hmm. It's pretty obvious. And they just haven't like really paid attention to podcasting. I think it's just like too small of a thing for them to pay attention to. But at some point, these are going to merge. I mean, the way I use podcasts is like, I'll sometimes watch them on YouTube on my phone and then I get to go drive, whatever. And I pull it up as a podcast or turn YouTube off and just it, it plays yep. in the background. Yep. Play I'm like, YouTube premium why are these two things like not, you know, together? So with YouTube premium, I'll prefer to watch the, the podcast on YouTube in some respects because I could just turn it off and then I still got the audio going. Right. The downside is the podcast native player on Apple is just so good in terms of I could skip, yeah. I could go back, I could pause um, in my car when it's saying directions, it automatically turns off. You know, it just knows what's up. Yeah. So I'm hoping that those two things converge. The other thing I think that's happening, I'm sure you've seen all the, the demos of AI of, of like where it like translates the podcast. So we could be speaking Hindi, like our voices are the inflections and our mouths yep. all are speaking Hindi. And so someone who speaks Hindi natively can just listen. It's to just it. like, great. I love that. That's just opening up to a whole new world. Also, as, as a consumer of a lot of podcasts myself, I would love to listen to some like Nordic guy talk about his, his point of views, but I just don't. <laughs> know how to speak <laughs> yeah. your language. So yeah, you're, you're not brushed up on your Norwegian. No, not, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah. b- believe it or not. No. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and just imagine the profound change that alone would have. So I think there's a lot of benefit in podcasting, but also it does make sense that podcasts have this video element to them. This is how we see the world with our, with our eyes and ears. So that, well, I mean, so many people, right. Are scrolling on their phone before they go to bed or something and they enjoy a little clip of a podcast mm-hmm. and then they don't think anything of it. And then a couple of days later, there's a different clip and they're like, that was good to, Oh, I, I saw Neville. What, what it actually is this. Right. And then you start to click in and, and discover it. And then that's where, or even you train the algorithm. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause it's like, oh, you watch this to the end. And then, you know, a few days later, they're like, eh? and you're like, you watch that one to the end as well. And then the algorithm is just going to feed you more and more of that. I mean, I think that's how I discover everyone now. Mm-hmm. That, that's just, that's just the way I do it. And it can't just be me. So, I mean, that even with these podcasts at the end, I always put like a little lightning around because I'm like, that's the clips. That's yeah. the clip maker. Well, and so the thing is podcasts, if you think about a content flywheel, I think that podcasts are absolutely key to that because it is hard to come up with new ideas for content. Where if we're sitting down and I'm like, Neville, what's the, what's the newsletter for this week going to be about? And you're like, I don't know. I haven't, 
I haven't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. I, you know? Yeah. Right. Or like any of these things that you're sitting down and like, okay, I need to make clips for Instagram. What clip is going to do what, like, what can I make? And then you're like sitting down to do a take and you're like, okay, here we go. Now that was crap. Okay. Let me No, that one was bad too. And podcasting, it's like, we get to just talk and riff on ideas and then go back and figure out what was good. Mm -hmm. And so then that turns into clips, the clips that are good. We're like, Hey, that took off. I guess people love that idea. In the same way you're talking with the tweets where like, I'm going to do the content cascade and I'm going to, uh, turn that into a newsletter. Right. And so now when we're, it's the newsletter goes out Tuesday morning, it's Monday night. And I'm like, what am I going to send? Yeah. You know, Nathan said, I got to be consistent, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then I'm just looking through my most popular clips and going, oh, let me just write about that. I can write 500 words. I can turn this 60 second clip and the idea behind totally. it into a 500 word thing. And so it's way easier to come up with ideas in a podcast. Than yeah. It sounds like the writing. king is the person that does long form. That's the, their main thing. Yeah. And then they have someone else just cut up the clips to promote it. I think so. That, because if you're just making short form clips, uh, believe me, I've tried that. You will go goddamn crazy. If you're trying to release a clip a day, <laughs> yeah, that is insane. Because actually taking one of those clips involves all the same things of making a long form video. You have to have an idea. You got to maybe like, you know, get ready for the camera, look a yeah. little bit presentable, set up all the stuff, do all those things edit it. There's a ton of editing because clips have a lot more like little cuts and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Uh, it's, it's like you're making a whole YouTube video every day, but it's just really short. Yeah. And it, well, it's like the quote of like, basically, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. <laughs> right. And it's, it's the same thing. Cause it's like, I can make a 10 minute video and it doesn't have to be perfect, but if I want to convey that same idea in 60 seconds. It's gotta be pretty damn perfect. And that's really hard to do. I mean, sometimes you see like a TikTok or an Instagram reel and you're just like someone, someone, it's a 30 second clip yep. and they do like five outfit changes in it, at, like a skit. They're doing a skit and like, Hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And they're in different locations, different outfits. And I'm like, just that alone is a lot of time and effort yep. to think about that, plan out that and to go execute that over the course of several days. That is a lot of work for just one form clip. So if you have something like this, you record it once, this ends up being 10 clips, which mm -hmm. is awesome. So it sounds like that's the flywheel right when, now. Yeah. And the algorithm... Interestingly, or it's not just one algorithm, but algorithms on the platforms seem to really reward podcasts, right? And and reward those clips. And so it's like, all right, this this is really, really good. One thing that's interesting is the like the emphasis on in-person podcasts. Mm -hmm. Right? Most people will do in-person podcasts. I know a lot of people, like I was talking to two people, David Perel uh, and Ryan Holiday mm -hmm. about this in two separate conversations. Ryan was saying, uh, cause he now has a, a great studio set up in his bookstore. Mm -hmm. He was like, as much as possible, we do in-person podcasts because the clips perform like five times as well. Yeah. And David Perel was saying the same thing of like, Great. We'll, we'll go and do an in-person podcast. And he's like, I'm trying to do absolutely everything. I think David actually has the firm line. He's only doing in-person. Uh, and the reason is because the content performs so much better. Yeah. I think if you actually break down why, it's just like, okay, we're recording with 4K cameras in here. Yep. When you record on Zoom, then it looks like ass, right? Yeah. So even if you have a good setup, it's still like a little different. The 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 antithesis to that is someone like Sam and Sean of My First Million. They really, they really invested in their, their camera setups and everything like that. And even before, um, they make the, the editing and everything is still really good yeah. and they're not together. So th there is some uh, validity to like, you can do internet podcasts. I think Jay Klaus is doing a really good job with his like not in person yep. things. I think we're in Austin. So we get away with like, we could have a lot of people come by over here. You know, you're swinging by all the yeah. time. And so that makes sense. But if you're like in a location where like people just aren't there, you kind of got to do internet based podcasts. I think they're just going to get better and better. I think so. And and there's two different goals in it, right? Like, I don't think the quality of the conversation is that much better in person, mm -hmm. but the quality of the clip is mm. because if I scroll through there's there, I don't know if this will last, but I think there's a perceived quality when you see like, oh, the chair, the mic, right. It automatically looks a certain way yeah. in the clip. And I'm like, oh, this content was worth recording in a studio. And so I'm like, oh, this is a little bit better than like anybody on Zoom can do this. Interesting. But the, I don't know the quality of the conversation is that much better. They're like, oh, you have to get on a plane. So like Sam and Sean, most of the time that I listen to My First Million, I'm doing the dishes or 
you know, out on a walk or something else. Yeah. I'm not even looking at the video. I know what those two look like. Mm -hmm. Though I always laugh when people get their voices backwards. Like, (laughs) because they joke about that where people will see like them on video for the first time. They're like, oh, I like from podcast cover art to voice, they just assume that the other person. I've heard that too. I guess I've known them both for 10 plus years that I'm like, how could you mess them up? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But in that, I think that you can do all of these uh, remote recordings and it'll be just fine, but the clips will not perform as well on other platforms. Yeah, this is, this is far more to fun too. Okay. I, I find it, it's, it's more of a bonding. So originally what I had was I set up a podcast studio in my home. In your office, yeah. Yeah, so I actually have you know the three cameras, I got all the lights, I got all the stuff, got a switcher board, and I used to get a producer in there. And the problem is, now I have to get my schedule, my house ready, right. and then you have to come to my house, which, which I thought would be the fun part. It was kind of like yeah. a Joe Rogan inspired Yeah, yeah come thing. on over. And- come on over, we'll hang out. Dude, this is a six-hour process because because the producer comes earlier, sets all the stuff up, gets the yeah. lighting and everything, um, does the shots. And so now we're hanging out, just chatting. He's there. I'm offering him drinks and stuff like that. You come over. I give you a little house tour. It, it's like a whole deal. That's why it actually comes out cheaper and easier to come to a studio like this. Right. And just like we sit down and we record and get the hell out. Right. It actually becomes a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, let me let me ask you about uh, this stuff. Uh, AI. So. Everyone's talking about AI. As of yesterday, I think uh, OpenAI did their like AI day or whatever, and they announced GPTs and all these like, they're going to kill the plug-in store and make these things. Oh, I haven't even heard. I mean, there's so much news yeah. to like cover in this area. So, but this is, this is kind of the question is there's a lot of AI stuff and a lot of hype. And the first time you see something with AI, you're like, holy shit, this changes everything. Right. Then you use it day one, day two, you start dropping off a little bit. By day three, you're like, I never use this at all. This is, uh, I don't even know what I use this for. So I'm sure people are like, dude, you got to add this to, to convert kit. You got to put a little AI writing assistant. Like I write my newsletters. Why don't you just write it for me? I'm sure people are just pushing you to add this stuff. How do you go about and think about it of like, what's actually useful? How do you like cut through all the bullshit and, and yeah. notice like what's useful, what's not? Yeah, so I've taken... A that this feels weird to say, but a late to market approach to convert it, mm-hmm. right? Not at all the first email platform. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe the <laughs> maybe the last. <laughs> yeah, yeah, who knows? Yes, we were, we were trying to be the last one, right? Um, like a lot of things, if you wait and see what works, mm-hmm. then you can have this long, steady path, right? As a self funded company. Um, you know, we're bootstrapped. We don't have to like jump on every wave. And so right in, when you have all the, the crypto stuff going crazy, people are like, oh, what are you doing in web three? How are you making it so that I, people can tie their wallet and what they, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, the NFTs they own and then push out content and, and all of that. And we're like, that's super interesting. I'm going to have conversations. I'm going to draw up what that could look like. And I'm going to see if this has staying power. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, cool. I didn't just waste half a million dollars building out all this other functionality. Yeah. <laughs> and so in, in AI, there's one thing of like jumping on it right away mm-hmm. and throwing in like a cheap wrapper on GPT, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting. There's some really good uh, writing tools that are helpful as, as a writer. And instead we, we take this approach of like, let's be thoughtful and let's see what was actually going to be useful in a lasting way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what we're doing right now is just playing with different experiments and seeing like, okay, what what do I actually want to use as a creator? Mm-hmm. So from that side, like one thing that I'm curious about is as an avid writer yourself mm-hmm. and newsletter operator and all of that, like what are the things that you think would be interesting use cases of AI? It's so funny because I've seen a lot of people implement these yeah. and it's just like, like Canva is an example. They've actually done a good job. They're implementing everything and then just like removing stuff that doesn't really work, which is hard to do. Like, cause there's usually some person you're like, oh, this didn't work. We'll remove it. And there's one person who's like, no, I love this. You're like, all right, I guess we'll keep it. And then the product gets bloated over time. And well, I think yeah. it's just so easy to implement an AI thing. It's just yeah. a little API thing. You tie it in, a coder can do it in five seconds and implement yeah. some shitty version of it really quick. And then you modify it. <clears throat> but for, for example, let me just harp on this Canva thread for a second. One thing they did was if you have a widescreen image and you want to make it a square now, mm-hmm. in the past, Photoshop or anything would just blow up your whole image. All the stuff would be out of place. 
So what they did was an AI version of that. And they call it like magic resize or something. Yeah. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is actually quite helpful because I'll post something on Twitter and then I like want to make a slide on it for one of our presentations, which we make in squares. Yeah. And I, it's like the dumbest problem ever. It's just like, whoop, shrinking it down. That's all we're doing. Yeah. But it always blows up and it, we always have to manually remove everything. And they just made it to where it, it just happens. It just works. And so now it's just called resize. <laughs> like, like I don't care that it has, I don't care how you do it. <laughs> yeah. It does not matter to me one iota, just resize it and all the crap's in place. Mm -hmm. And so they do that. And there's all this magic behind the scenes, which I'm sure to the developers is like, this is insane what it's doing. It's like, yeah, I don't care. It yeah, just works. Just do it. Just, just make it happen. And so I think there's functions like that where you're like, oh, that's actually useful. This is actually solving a problem where someone makes a widescreen thing and then make it a square and now they have to move everything around. This is a common problem we see people doing. And so they made that like a native feature. And I'm like, that's a great implementation yeah. that you, you typically wouldn't have noticed. They do have an AI writer and never use it. Um, I'm like, well, I have chat GPT. So why would I use it? Like your crappy implementation of chat GPT. And so it's kind of weird. Like with the AI stuff, I'll use all these demos. My mind is blown day one, yep. day two, the, the, the mind blown tank yeah, starts. Does emptying. it get in your workflow? Yeah. By, by the, the next week, I'm like, oh yeah, I haven't opened up that thing at all. The thing that I thought was going to change. And the that's what I think is interesting. A, a bunch of these standalone products, I think are, are going to struggle mm -hmm. as an AI platform. Because they're not injected in a workflow, mm -hmm. but then the platform like a ConvertKit or a Canva or something that you are in, you know, every single week, no matter what, if that, at, if that takes some of your existing process and automates it or makes it easier with AI, mm -hmm. then that's going to get used all the time. Cause you don't have to leave and go do it somewhere else. But I've been talking to a lot of people familiar with this and it sounds like most of the existing or big companies are going to capture most of the value for this. Yeah. It's, it's not like the little guy is going to just like come up with a wrapper and, and implement it. Maybe there is some of that going on, but for the most part, a company like HubSpot has been implementing AI, where it's like they tie right. it in. It's like, make me a newsletter that does this. And it just kind of does it, but it's already like tools inside. Mm -hmm. I think, so I think like with ConvertKit, it could be something like that where, you know, you tell it like, send out a newsletter with these things, just make it for me. And then I'm going to edit it. And it automatically comes up with stuff that could be interesting. It's like, it's one of those things that sounds cool, but then like, would people really use that functionality? I'm not sure. Yeah. A couple of things that we're playing with are like a lot of newsletters are recommendations for articles where, mm -hmm. where you're like, okay, I watched um, the Netflix show, the redeem team. And I loved it, right? Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. So I want to mention that in my article and write two sentences or three sentences recommending it. Mm -hmm. And if in the editor, I can just be like, recommend and drop a link. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there you go. I'm like, oh, it's one tweak. There we go. That That's perfect, right? That made it a little bit faster. Or another thing we're playing with is um, using AI to better pair creators in our creator network mm. of like, here's who you should partner with. Interesting. Um, taking all this data that we have and saying, you know, these are the, the creators that are the best fit. You know, there's an audience overlap. There's an interest. Um, so we're playing with some of those things of, okay, if we can actually use it to like help you as a creator, meet more people and grow your list faster then that's interesting. Yeah. Because we run a, we run a writing company, right? People are always asking, like, what about AI? Now they could do it. It's just like, I think what it's doing, it's actually writing all the supporting content really well. So for example, we, we're going to publish this YouTube video. Now I got to write a description. Oh yeah. I got to write those chapters and like, be like at 36 seconds, he said this, and like it's, that's a lot of time mm -hmm. on something that's not that useful. Um, I have to tag, do tagging everything. Now AI kind of just does all that for us. And I'm very happy about that. So you can focus on the, the, what actually matters. Yes. The other thing people are like, oh, is AI going to replace writing or writers? And I, I think it's going to replace a lot of mediocre writing. Yeah. And so now when I think about creating content, I want to create content that cannot be written by AI because it is something, it's telling a story that only I can tell mm -hmm. or something from a, you know only my perspective. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm trying to write a Twitter thread, right, instead of, you know, doing an AI summary of a Wikipedia page with some random images thrown in, hoping that that goes viral, which often does, you know, you're like, there's nothing unique about that, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm trying to write about my experience building a company, my experience doing something, you know, out in the real world, how exactly we implement something at ConvertKit. And so that's what I think if you don't want to be replaced by AI, like go have real world experiences mm -hmm. 
do interesting things and tell those stories. And that can't be written by AI. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's called a library article where it's just like, uh, what type of plant food does X use? Yeah, the, yeah. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. So SEOs used to like build these sites that are like library sites and that used to work really well. That will be, in my opinion, 100% replaced with generative AI. Oh, yeah. Because it could write a better article faster and come up with it on the fly with up-to-date information. And then you're just like random article competing with that. Right. It's, it's just not going to happen. However, but like you said, a personal story, how I started ConvertKit for it would made $19,000 while learning yeah. code. That's not something a generative AI would come up with necessarily. And people want to hear these human stories. Yeah. So I'm also hoping that it expands the amount of content I could put out. For example, I went to see you 2 at the, the, the Sphere yep. in Las Vegas. Yeah, I saw your, I saw your and, Instagram stories. I, I put an Instagram story. It, it's also work to put up an Instagram story. Then I want to share it on Twitter. And I was writing it yesterday. And it was like this long thread. It's not that good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, this is a lot of goddamn work. And it's not like I make money off of this, right? I'm right. not like make, getting sponsorship from the Sphere or YouTube or anything like that. I'm just doing this because I want to document it myself. Like we used to do back in the day with blogs. Like, you like I went to South right. by Southwest. And you put all your pictures and what you did. I'm hoping that the AI gets good enough to help me write content I never would write. So for example, I would love it to just take all these pictures and tell it in like a story format and put it on all the socials. Right. That would be awesome. Then I don't have to do it. I get to remember. Yeah, and you share go into your ca camera roll. Like I'm thinking about yeah. the, on this trip, right? I'm out here in Austin having a bunch of meetings with people um, that I'm big fans of. I've got photos from that. And if I could just open up the camera roll, select seven photos and be like, create story. And it knows like, oh, that's Ryan Holiday in the photo, right? Like that's a very knowable Do thing. Do a Nick Gray style Instagram yeah. story. It's like, hey, I met my friend Ryan Holiday, <laughs> yeah. dot, dot, dot. <laughs> then we went to, duh. then I saw Neville at a podcast thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, that would be fantastic. So I really wanted to write things that I would not have the time to write. And then just remember, I have to do that on Instagram. Then I have to do that on in a video oh, format. Yeah. And then I have to do it on Twitter. This is a full-time job to document right. one event and you're already busy. I mean, this is stuff you just can't do anymore. So, uh, well, to wrap this up, let's do a bunch of random questions. Um, what is kind of like the most popular trend you're seeing right now with like all your insights at ConvertKit? Popular, there's a bunch of different things, but the, the biggest thing is creators partnering up to grow faster. Mm -hmm. It's like the early days of guest posting or backlinks yeah. happening all over again, right? Everything old is new again. If mullet, if mullets are back, <laughs> then like, <laughs> you know, all of these things. And what's funny to me is that you get these creators who feel like they've just discovered the most exciting thing. Like I had someone explain the concept of lead magnets to me the other day. And they're like, look, so here's the deal. If you go from social and you tell someone to subscribe to your newsletter, like that converts at like 1%. But if you give them something valuable, like a, you know, an ebook or a free guide, it converts at like, and I'm just like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's basically, I'm seeing that all these old things are new. And so these guest posts and swaps and then like creator network um, is really where everyone's growing much faster because of pairing up with other creators. Do you remember blog carnivals? <laughs> do, do you remember this term yes. at all? It's just like everyone had blogs and I would like, I would like, hey, if you want me to be mention you next time. And so I'd mention Nathan, I mentioned Sam and like a, a link oh, yeah. list, I guess. That's, that's <laughs> that was kind of Good the times. old school way of like social growth. Uh, if you were going to, if you were going to start a business today, you're like a young person, what's one that you would be attracted to? What you like based on what you're seeing? What type of business? Yeah. Like, like a newsletter. Would you start a podcast? Would you start software? Uh, oh man. So I have this essay called the ladders of wealth creation mm -hmm. and it breaks down basically how you move up in both the income that you're earning and then the wealth that you create from it and the skills that you have to learn along the way. Hmm. And so I absolutely love software as a business, but I would not start there because it is like a high rung on the most difficult ladder. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons that I like services businesses uh, and I like, you know, content businesses is that they're often like they're starting on simpler ladders at lower down rungs. So you can learn a lot of these skills. So I'd be really careful to not tackle, you know, a very complicated business, right? People are like, uh, when I worked in software, uh, a lot of people would come to me and like, Hey, I've, I, I'm going to build Facebook for this or Uber for that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to explain that. Like you just said, you want to start a marketplace or a social network, which is the most difficult product 
in like company in existence. That is the absolute hardest thing to do. So like your skills are all the way down here and you just said that you want to tackle the absolute hardest problem. Mm -hmm. And so I'd really encourage people to find these problems. I think freelancing is a great one that like allow you to get some early wins, get paid Mm -hmm. and learn basic skills, right? How to show up consistently, how to set up an LLC and file with the secretary of state, right? Like Mm -hmm. once you've done it, you're like, oh, that's easy. But if you haven't done it, you're like, what, what is a a registered agent? That sounds so official. What even is that? (laughs) You know? And so you have to learn these things. And so I'd say like, don't try to tackle like your forever business. Try to find the business that's going to help you learn a bunch of skills so you can tackle the next thing. Um, Inside the ConvertKit ecosystem, what is the most popular thing that people have? Is it a YouTube channel? Is it podcasts? Or is it a newsletter? Or are they just using to send out promotions? The newsletter is the most popular thing. And it, is there like a percentage of that? Or like, is it like 50, 40% or don't know? I mean, self-selected, right? Because we we are an email and a newsletter platform. That's mm-hmm. going to be the biggest. Um, as far as what's driving other growth, um, and you get a lot of authors and a lot of podcasters, mm. you know, so, so people like, um, an Andrew Huberman or something like that growing, right. A very big newsletter on ConvertKit mm-hmm. off of the success of the podcast. Um, books, are there any, is there any specific book that's really, really changed the course of your life? Uh, the change of the course of my life. That's a, that's a tall order, but I think some of the, a uh, couple that I love is anything you want by Derek Sivers. Mm-hmm. That one, super, super short. And just, I've probably gifted that book more than any other. Mm -hmm. Um, Chris Gillibo's The $100 Startup of just Mm -hmm. like a bunch of examples of like, here is how you can start a business. I used to, like you hear this um, saying, it takes money to make money, Mm -hmm. right? And you're like, oh, it takes money to make money. I guess that's just always true. And so Chris's book, The $100 Startup was really good at like, okay, here's a bunch of businesses that got started for a hundred dollars. So mm-hmm. yes, it takes money to make money, but like you can start with a hundred bucks. So that was good. And then I've, I, I think uh, the four hour work week is one of those that just like, when you first read it, like 12 years ago, 15 years ago, like it just break, it broke my brain where I was like, this is all possible. And then just sent me down this, this path. So probably those three are some of the best. Nice. Uh, what kind of to-do list person are you? Are you writing it down on paper? You got like a, a note stock in your phone? What do you got? I'm the person that would write down the to-do item. Like on so paper. that I could, yeah, so that I could cross it off. Right? Scratch. Do you, like, <laughs> yeah. do you like the scratch? Yeah. Uh, so I do two different things. Sometimes I'll write it on paper, just in my notebook. Uh, but most often I have like a notion to-do list for the day. Um, but I'm, I'm using that to stay focused. Like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then I actually ha- have, um, I got this from Andy Triba, who is a software founder um, uh, here in Austin, actually. And he, oh, I just copy what he did. I have a a timer that sits mm-hmm. on my desk um, for like a Pomodoro timer for like 25 minute increments. Mm-hmm. And then I have a little dish that has 10 marbles in it. It's a two-sided dish and there's mm. 10 marbles in one side and nothing in the other. And what I do is I've got my to-do list. And I start the timer and start on the first task that I'm working through. And then when I finish that, I move one marble over. And then I like, and so the goal is to get 10 marbles moved over. And that would be 10, 25 minute increments of focused work. Whoa. Right. And so I just have this, this goal of like, like these art, like physical artifacts on my desk of, uh, how much focused work time did I get in, in today? And so I'm like starting to jump off something else. I'm like, oh, right. But the marbles and the timer, right? Like I'm trying to finish this. I've heard of Pomodoro. I've never heard of this marble thing. That sounds great. Yeah. So it's it's just like, how do you track how many Pomodoros? And you could write it on a piece of paper, but like the marble thing is. There's something, there's something about the The tactile action. Yeah. Oh man. That's actually a great piece of advice. I love this. That's, that's amazing. So you're, you're a com you're a combo of handwritten. Yeah. Digital. I, I don't really care where the, originally it'd be handwritten, but now working with an assistant and all of that, if I put it in notion, she understands what I'm working on. She adds things to my to-do list mm-hmm. and that, that works much better. Nice. Um, writing seems to be a big part of your, your thing. Yeah. Um, how did you get better at writing? Just reps. Reps is really, really important. Uh, I think that the feedback loop, like publishing content is really good. So many people are trying to get better at writing in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. 
And it's like, what are you doing? Yeah, so. feedback on it. Like I love following some of these comedians who when you see them getting started early, mm-hmm. uh, there's someone named Sarah Cooper who I've followed for years and years. She like really got a ton of attention when she would do these uh, imitations of Trump when he was in office. Mm-hmm. And so her clips would, would go crazy. But if you followed her on Twitter, you would see her post something and like see how it went. And if it didn't get much traction, she'd just delete it. Yeah. You know? And so her her thread was actually all these things like just hit after hit, right? But she's testing content. She's seeing what worked. Was that funny? Did that land? And so I think the biggest thing you can do to improve your writing is not just the reps, but getting the reps in public where you're getting feedback on it. Mm. And then instead of saying, oh, that didn't work, never mind," You're like, no, I, I think there's something here, but I didn't get the hook right. So let me try it again. And so also like a lot of these social platforms, Twitter especially, they let you repost content. Yeah. Right? So you can come back and repost your best threads either with the same hook or a different hook later. And so you get to iterate and get feedback. And so I, I would write in public specifically. Huh. That's, that's actually great advice i mean the 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 classic thing was like henry david thoreau would go out Mm -hmm. into the woods and 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 write but back then they didn't have twitter yeah (laughs) so i I bet if he was around you know he'd he'd be posting stuff on twitter or einstein would be like have a you know be a thought boy or something like that yeah you know (laughs) you'd get these poems being posted you know (laughs) so uh and then we'll start wrapping this up i'm just curious because like now you've got this company that I mean, I don't know want to predict anything, but it's like valued at $320 million, yeah. you said. Uh, probably on track to keep growing as far as you could tell. I mean, the metrics show it. And you have always publicly had your revenue and everything out there. Correct. It's what, what's the, what's the, it's ConvertKit. If you go ConvertKit.com slash metrics. Yeah. You'll see the same dashboard that I look at every day, updated in real time. Yeah. We churn, how many people signed up. All, yep. It's like completely transparent. Yeah. You'll not be like, people give you credit for this. I don't know why it's not <laughs> bigger news. What's funny is it's been... People are like, oh, is this like a marketing gimmick that you do? And I'm like, it's been public since we were like at $2,000 a month in revenue. And yeah. now we're a little over 3 million a month. In but revenue. most people, once they cross like the 1 million mark, they're like, yeah, I'm going to take these down. Yeah. But, but you've kept them up, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's, so our mission for the company is we exist to help creators earn a living, mm-hmm. right? That everything we do comes back to how do we help creators get paid? Mm-hmm. And so I want to leave as many breadcrumbs as possible mm-hmm. for other people of like what could work. And so a, a creator is someone with a podcast. It's also someone building a SaaS company. Mm-hmm. And so if they're like, hey, you know, I'm at 20,000 a month in revenue and I'm really struggling with churn and people are telling me like at this churn number, you know, your business will never grow. Mm-hmm. I wonder what ConvertKit's churn was when they were at $20,000 a month. Well, go to the dashboard, expand the view, like look all the way back and be like, oh, you know, whatever. In 2015 was the, when that was. Okay, click on that, set the date range. You're like, oh, ConvertKit's churn was insanely high, mm-hmm. right? We were being told this business will never grow because you you know you're going to cap out and churn. No, it turns out like churn goes down over time, and you improve the product and everything else, right? So being able to leave these breadcrumbs that other founders could look at and understand what's possible, not from like random sporadic interviews, but it's just like there's all the data. Like, have fun. And I'm sure, I'm sure there must be an element of like, because it's public, you like pay attention to those numbers more. Well, I, I would be like that. So I'm just projecting here, but. I don't know that I pay attention to it more, but these are the matter, the numbers that matter the most in the business. Uh-huh. So I'm going to pay attention to them no matter what. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. It's, it's a fun thing. I think it, what also helps though, is you optimize for different things, right? If say if we're both running software companies and I'm like, Hey, how's business going? You're like, great. We're going to double headcount this year. People say that because you, there's something weird about saying the numbers, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you're like, yeah, we're going to hit a million dollars in revenue this year. I'm like, dude, stop bragging. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And you're like, why are we using another proxy for how the business success is? Because there, there's this weird idea where apparently we can't talk about revenue numbers. So by putting it all out there publicly, I can just say ConvertKit is at a $40 million a year run rate, mm-hmm. right? And I can say that specifically. And so I don't subconsciously optimize for headcount, right? In the business world, everyone's saying like, oh, we won't say revenue numbers, but I'll say headcount. Mm-hmm. And so you get into traps like, oh, I'm going to double headcount, which is a terrible idea yeah. for a business. <laughs> but I know tons of software founders that optimize for headcount because like, I think it's subconscious. You know, like, oh, if I go to this uh, to this event, I'm going to be like, oh, we have 100 employees, you know, or we have 500 employees. And you're like, 
entirely like a terrible metric to optimize for. Yeah. But it's socially acceptable. So that's what we talked about. And so I'd be really careful what, like I would talk publicly about the metrics that you've actually optimized for so that your like conscious and subconscious brains are aligned towards That's a great thing. point. But also I remember like I started blogging like 1999. I had to like make like an HTML blog oh, yeah. for myself and no one talked about their money online. I was one of the first people to like mention how much money, who I was and how much money I was making with my, you know, tiny little side projects in college. But it is a completely different world now. Like on Twitter, people are like, I make this much money. I put it, they just put their amount of money. That is a thing that happened in the last like 10 to 15 years. Yeah. People did not talk about money like that. So I think that's probably why they subconsciously do that. But then, yeah, you start optimizing for like, oh, we have 200 people. You're like, yeah, but you don't make a lot of money. You right. pay. Or yeah, you make no problem. Because these businesses are actually failing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, here, here's a random question outside of our normal scope. Tell me something about rich people that 99% of people don't know. I feel like you, you've been, you're in this upper echelon now. What, what's something that uh, most people don't realize? Oh. I mean, I think most people who have a lot of money aren't flashy or showy about it, right? Um I'm trying to think about things that people don't recognize. I, I feel like a lot of these conversations that people are having are are actually pretty accurate, right? If you listen to My First Million or some of these other shows where like Sam and Sean are talking about like things that they spend money on or Sam will break down and he's like, this, this is my ideal life in New York for the summers. And, you know, it costs, I don't remember the numbers, you know, but $40,000 a month or something like that mm -hmm. to get exactly what I want. So I think those conversations are are happening. Probably the... The biggest thing, like my favorite thing to spend money on is anything that optimizes time, right? Mm -hmm. Like yesterday, I chartered a plane to come down here because that's like, there's no direct Boise Austin flight, you know? And so this gets me there. There's a car waiting right there, driving, like it's all about not what's going to be, you know, showy or necessarily most luxurious, but it's about what, what helps me maximize uh, time. And so I think that's like... Yeah, that, that's the best thing. And then I was talking to someone else about this. Uh, a coworker actually who's been over to my house plenty of times um, for various things. And she was saying like, you don't have a showy house in any way. And it's like, yeah, we live a pretty normal, normal life. But then at the same time, I'll go book a plane to come down here. Cause it's basically like, I think the the wealthy people that I respect are the ones who know what matters to them mm -hmm. and like optimize for that. Mm-hmm. Even in other little things, like I love to go boating and wake surfing, mm -hmm. but we don't own a boat. Mm -hmm. We have a membership to a place with boats so that I don't like, you know, I take the boat out and then I come back and I'm like, there are the keys. Yeah, <laughs> you clean know? it up. <laughs> like, thing. I don't, I don't want to like get in a big fight with my wife over like backing the, the boat yeah. in the water. <laughs> like, you know, you see people doing that and you're like, that's a recipe for divorce right yeah. there. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so I think, you know, you end up optimizing a ton for convenience and like often renting things that you could own because it's just way easier to rent them. Well, so I get, I, this isn't an argument I have, but with a lot of people, they think they want to optimize every single thing and you don't do anything yourself that like other people could do like cooking or something. But I think cooking for some, for, for example, I like grilling. Yeah. It's fun. Like it's some like a nice break from things. It's fun to do. I could get someone to do it for me, oh, yeah. but I don't want to. Uh, house projects, like you'd ask Sam, because we, we, we live right next to each other. He's like, Neville loves house projects. Ooh, I, I got excited. Yeah. I bought a weed eater. <laughs> yeah, I, and, he, and then I you come over to his house. His I'm like, do you have stuff that needs to be trimmed? <laughs> he's probably like, no, I pay someone for that. <laughs> I know. He, he had already got his lawn. Done, and I have a I have a lawn guy that I haven't called in yep. three months because I'm just so excited to just like go oh, and yeah. do everything. It, put it, just put so in a good fun. podcast and get some, get some yard work done. Yeah, it's, it's just fun. And so I noticed that you do that too. Like I know that you built out your Airbnb. You have like an Airbnb on your property or multiple maybe. Yep, multiple. And you did it yourself. Now you have the means to like get someone to do it. Yeah. But you still did it. Yeah. So there's, there's so many reasons for it. Like first there's things that for a long time I wouldn't pay for that I absolutely should have, right? Like hiring a nanny. I should have done that way sooner mm -hmm. than we did. Right. We were juggling like too many things with childcare and, and all of that. Right. Doing that huge, huge life improvement. But then, like, as we've done these Airbnbs, one of the things that I love about it is it's a business that my kids can understand. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're like, you know, dad, how do we make money? 
Yeah. You know, it's like, well, you see, there's like 50,000 people somewhere on the internet and they use it, they put in their credit cards and they, you know, like you're familiar with subscription software, right? And they're like, <laughs> what? You know, none of that makes sense. But if we have this Airbnb and it's like, this is how we make, you know, someone pays us to stay here for the night and then either we clean it or we pay someone to clean it, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. And then you can explain like cost of goods sold and margin and all these things. My kids love spreadsheets. So my, my nine-year-old is oh. like, dad, can we make spreadsheets? <laughs> um, and so we can like make a spreadsheet or I can show them a spreadsheet for um, the Airbnbs. And like, it's a, it's a very tangible thing. And then we'll also do things like one of the Airbnbs we co-own with some friends of ours who have kids at a similar age. Mm -hmm. And for like two or three Saturdays in a row, we went over there and like, got the kids involved and we're all setting up furniture and doing all this, which you could very easily pay other people to do. Mm -hmm. But I want my kids to have that memory of like, oh yeah, we, this is us like building an asset. They're not going to understand at that level, but mm -hmm. you know, that then is going to cash flow. Um, and you start to think about like, oh, this is the money that you can live off of. Um, and it's just fun. Like we're ordering pizza and working on this and it's the project. Time. And, um, and so it's a way to make all of this tangible. And I think that's a, a you know, going to have some big steps towards like kids who are thoughtful about money and understand like the principles to build wealth because uh, they see it lived out and they're a part of it rather than just like, I don't know, like dad's got a software company and that makes a bunch of money. And so we have fancy stuff. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that's awesome. That, that, that sounds like a great life you got going on there. So kudos to that. How can people uh, find you, follow you, all that stuff? Yeah. So my blog is nathanberry.com and Barry is B-A-R-R-Y. And uh, then Twitter, Instagram, everywhere else, that's where I'm. And then uh, I have a podcast called Billion Dollar Creator, which people should subscribe if they're looking for. How do you take an audience and build it into a massive company? Like what's the highest ROI way to do that? And so the podcast is exploring that idea. Sweet. That sounds sweet. Dude, thanks so much for yeah. coming on. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Good times. Take care.